a common theme in horror um, as a genre, um, horror fiction, although I suppose it, you know, could be realistic horror about things that actually happened, is um, don't open that door, don't go into that room, don't open that envelope type thing. Um, you probe too far and you get make a horrible discovery, a horrific discovery, a discovery that shocks you or panics you in an existential way. Don't question, don't ask certain questions because you may not know the answers. <clears throat> now, I understand that kind of feeling. Um, but I'd like to sort of examine that idea. Dangerous ways of thinking or dangerous ways of... A, a dangerous degree of, of curiosity or a dangerous degree of um, open-mindedness, I guess. Um, to the point where, like, nowadays we see a lot of talk about core values. And if you question those core values, it is somehow implied something horrible will result. Uh, it's kind of a restating of Hobbes's position on chaos. Um, if we don't have something to stand in awe of, if we don't have some sort of fundamental truth um, that is not only agreed upon, but we kind of kind of collectively solipsistically, to use an Orwellian term, we create this collective solipsism that there is a reality out there that we can access that is an actual truth. You know, Zafi's anchor as well. Um, and uh, isolation, collective isolation, where we kind of shell ourselves in. There's something about, something Aristotelian in all of this, where we say that humans are the measure of everything. Now, in a sense, I agree, but we've got to understand what we mean by humans being the me measure of everything. Um, someone, say, is concerned about the vastness of what we don't know or what we don't understand or what we are not prepared to experience, again, is my favorite guy, H.P. Lovecraft, where he posits a universe that's infinite cold and infinitely older than anything that we can possibly imagine and that if we actually do come to terms or find some way of discovering just how tiny and how insignificant and how helpless we are in the cosmos will go insane. Okay, that's one view of things. Um, and as I say, when people start talking and questioning things like core values, and we see this now, it tends to frighten people or it can frighten people of a certain turn of mind. I guess loosely we could call such people conservatives, but that's not necessarily true. A lot of people who consider themselves liberals or even progressives or leftists are just as sort of wedded to the idea of certainty. They've just got a different view as to what certainty is than a conservative. Um, <clears throat> an interesting thing about, say, the, the dynamics of a country like the United States where you know, everyone looks at it and says anything goes there. Any you know any idea is expressed openly. Any religious persuasion can get a following. Any sort of belief in anything will have its adherence, and nobody really believes anything. Well, not necessarily. Um, there are core um, values or core truths that all Americans seem to just take for granted, or almost all of them. Uh, one of them being that the United States is a unique country in human history. Another one is their f belief in the Constitution and things like this. Now, I'm not parodying this. I'm simply, you know, perhaps it's best if, if I point out that I'm, I'm kind of addressing a non-American audience here, although most of my subscribers, I think, are Americans. Um, you have... <coughs> um, you have certain truths that everybody agrees cannot be questioned. And when you start questioning those truths, everybody gets spooked. Um, because they think that you're questioning something 
questioning something, not to understand it, but to dismantle it. For example, when you see the reverence that Americans hold their constitution in, you're, a lot of people are kind of disoriented by that, because to their mind, well, here's these hard-nosed practical people, Americans, with this I don't know which what would you call it decisive or fatal um, dose of idealism, which blinds them to everything else. Now, I'm not saying that this is what happens to Americans when they wave their flag or stand up and get a lump in their throat when the national anthem is played or whatever. It doesn't, in my opinion. American patriotism is misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, it doesn't actually mean that they're just blindly treating the Constitution or the flag as idols or something like this. It's just, they have to, the American society is in many ways so fragmented that they have to have some sort of glue to hold the whole thing together, and I think that American patriotism does a pretty good job of that. Um, you have to have people, like 315 million people, each one going their own way, a uh, society that cultivates individualism, i.e. cultivates it to the point where it makes it a cult. Um, individual rights, individual ex excellence, individual freedom, etc. You sort of think that's going to lead to anarchy, and that was why some of my maternal ancestors left South Carolina, what is now South Carolina, um, during the time of the American War of Independence. They said, we're out of here. This is, this is going to lead to chaos. This is just going to lead to societal disintegration. I see what you're saying, but you're playing with fire. Um, and they moved to Canada. <clears throat> of course, the, probably for every one person moving from the United States or the 13 colonies to Canada, there were two headed in the other way, saying, look at the great amount of freedom that's opening up here. Um, but again, I'm, I'm just pointing out the idea that if you if you question certain core values, people get spooked, and my ancestors got spooked by the questioning of core values that took place in 1776. Now, if you question the core values that were more or less, I won't say created in 1776, but that were more carefully codified from 1776 onward, the very same people who questioned the original core values now consider you a dangerous revolutionary or a dangerous and destructive force. Um, burning the flag or uh, questioning the sanctity, I guess, of the Constitution or, or um, ostentatiously putting your feet up and chewing gum or smoking a cigar when the national anthem is being played or something like this. Um, <clears throat> It isn't just seen as a rude thing to do. It, in some quarters, it's seen as a dangerous thing to do. Um, but again, Americans are torn. But don't we believe that he has the right to do that? Yes, but you understand what he's doing. He's attacking the very culture that gave him those rights, etc., etc. It's an insoluble problem that I think that it can only be addressed in terms of a necessary tension. A necessary tension or a necessary balance. We understand that the United States really is just a place where a bunch of human beings live. It's no more fabulous than anywhere else. But in order for us to maintain this experiment, we have to somehow tell ourselves that it is exceptional and it is fabulous. And it's this kind of dilemma there when we, you know, you kind of deep down you know that it really isn't, but in order to, in order to make it work, you have to assume that it is. And that assuming that it is kind of does make it so if you know what i'm saying that's you know collective solipsism right you're or you know living in a bubble now americans are not living in a bubble um america's wide open to the world you can say think or do basically whatever you like and now that isn't exactly the hallmark of an insular bunch of people um where people who are you know, like people aren't shocked by the appearance of new ideas say that they would be shocked, say, if you went to North Korea, where everything is certain, everything you ever hear is absolutely certain and unquestionable, and etc., etc. Well, there are certainties and there are things that you don't dare question in the United States as well, not because it's illegal to do so, but because there's some species of, I don't know, um, biting the hand that feeds you, 
question everything, and pretty soon you have nothing at all left. But it all depends on where you say the fatal questioning is taking place. My ancestors on my uh, on my mother's side believed that um, the um, the American Revolution was questioning core values to the point where they just couldn't handle living in this in the society anymore. But this is what they believed, <clears throat> so they left. Whereas other people were drawn to the United States because the core values were being questioned. Now you have the reverse taking place where core values are being questioned and the people who were sort of propounding the core values were the ones who were the revolutionaries back in 1776. So something is happening here. There's an interplay between question and don't question. Um, push the envelope and don't push the envelope because eventually you'll go through, you'll open one of those doors and on the other side is something resembling Satan and you've released this demon from the lamp or genie from the lamp that you can't get back in now. You've simply gone too far with your questioning. <clears throat> I think everybody thinks this way in one form or another. Um, I certainly do. There's abundant evidence of it in, in all of my videos. I have boundaries of conduct, right? Why do I have those boundaries of conduct? Well, well, if I if those boundaries of conduct are violated, I won't be able to accomplish anything on YouTube at all. Just be an endless shouting match or misrepresentation of everybody, endless trolling or whatever. Um, and that's kind of the same idea, isn't it? Don't don't go too far with your doubting. Um, you know, doubting Thomas type thing. Now, let's examine that idea. Uh, Lovecraft um, was kind of, if you ask me, heartily sick of the idea that um, the Age of Progress, which was the late 19th century, led the way, was going to lead the way to a wonderful new world where everything was wonderful and everything was perfect, whereas he just sort of looked out into the cosmos with all the new discoveries like Pluto or alternative or other galaxies or whatever and said, do you understand what science is telling us here? The size of the universe, the scale of time and space. Do you understand what that means? We're used to dealing with years or decades. The universe is billions of eons. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, that is not dead which can eternal lie, and in strange eons even death may die. He challenges you with things like that. Um, so what is it? Um, is questioning things uh, dangerous? Or questioning certain things, some things, is, that, is it fundamentally dangerous to do that? Um, as I say, core values. Tr people are accused of being of questioning this. Is that a dangerous thing? And in what way are you questioning them? Are you questioning them in order to refute them? Uh, or are you questioning them to see them for what they really are? I'll take the example again of the U.S. Constitution. And please understand, I'm not trying to ridicule the, the U.S. way of seeing things at all. I just want to see it for what it truly is. <clears throat> I say, for example, the Constitution is just a piece of paper and the flag is just a colored bit of cloth. The National Anthem is nothing more than a song. Um, Martin Luther King Day is just another day on the calendar. It doesn't really... And even the calendar is arbitrary. What difference does any of this make? So some people will say, yeah, you're kind of right, I see where you're going with this. And then they will, you know, they'll see it sort of intellectually, as it were, and say, yeah, I agree with everything that you're saying. And then they'll go on in their normal life and live a normal life, and they'll still get the lump in their throat when the national anthem was played, and they'll still, you know, get this warm, fuzzy feeling when they talk about the Constitution or the flag or whatever, even though part of them understands that it's all kind of just a necessary fiction. They don't really have trouble with that. And again, Orwell calls that doublethink. And I'm not really sure that doublethink really is as bad as he says it is because there's double think that can be actually helpful and in this case say double think in terms of um, 
belief in core values or belief in common values, even when there may be none, um, is is double think as well. But the human mind is capable of that. Um, have you ever met a Christian who simultaneously believes in creation and evolution? In other words, they may not have just asked themselves that question, or they've met, never really attempted to reconcile the two. It didn't. It, uh, I remember as a kid believing both at the same time. Uh, I was in, in science class, we were taught evolution, and then we went over to religion class, I went to Catholic school, and we were taught that the world was created by God in seven days, and all this kind of thing. And as children go, as children's minds go, this doesn't confuse you um, until you start asking questions, and then then you run into trouble. And I, of course, ran into that trouble at an early age. Because I started to think, and I started to say, well, let's reconcile all of this. One of these two has to be false. Either God created the world, or we, or, you know, the Big Bang did. Or, you know, one of these two, one of these has to be false. Well, depending on what compartment of your mind you're talking about, either one can be true and either one can be false. Again, you can... I go to Siad Vada here. In some ways it's true, in some ways it's not true, in some ways it's both true and untrue, and in other ways it's inexpressible or I can't get my point across effectively or whatever. It, We are capable of creating paradoxes in our own consciousness. We are capable of of reconciling or at least keeping contradictions from bothering us too much. As I always say, we look up in the sky every day, and I think what most people see up there is the first couple of miles or whatever, as far as their eyes can see. And After that, I think in their minds, it takes on the dimensions of something of a canopy. Like you look up and there's this thing up there called the sky. It's not a thing. That's eternity up there. Like, you look up and the sky goes on forever. Now think of the implications of that. We don't. This is nothing. No mysterious door that we're opening. All that we have to do is look up and ask, "What is that?" and seriously think it. Now, most of our lives we don't do that. We're too busy dealing with things at ground zero here. We're like the proverbial amoeba that can't really understand what a square is or what communism is or any of these other things because it simply is not in our field of vision uh, or an ant who sees what we call a lawn as a massive jungle whereas we just see it as a bunch of nice grass with a few bugs in it uh, from the point of view of the ant it's something very different from what we see <coughs> and is it is one of those perspectives an accurate one and the other one inaccurate? Well, they're both accurate, if you ask me, because there's nothing dangerous or jungle-like about a lawn to us, whereas to an ant or to you know any other small thing, it's survival of the fittest, and it's this is a jungle, and this is this is the ant's own universe, only universe. So it's both and it's neither. Lovecraft's universe both it both is and isn't horrifying, shocking, and vast beyond imagining. Um, it all depends on your perspective. It's funny that Orwell, or sorry, Lovecraft takes this big picture perspective in order to frighten people with it. He is writing from the point of view of somebody who sees things accurately, and he's showing to other people how inaccurate their view of reality is. Um, but again, you can always take Lovecraft's ideas of um, cosmicism and make them look kind of puny. If you want, I, it's not that difficult a thing to do. Just say, okay, Lovecraft, you've seen how vast the universe is. What are you? Tell me that. You, you, all that you're talking about is what's outside of us. What's inside of you? And suddenly the whole thing changes. So, are there things that we can't toy with? As I say, I'll question, say, for example, I was talking about the U.S. flag, the Constitution, the national anthem and all that sort of thing. I'll, con I'll, I'll question them and I'll say, okay, they're kind of necessary fictions or necessary, um, what would you call them, um, illusions or something like this that 
because we have such a pluralistic society where individualism is so highly valued, we need something that is, this is the point beyond which we don't go. And the point beyond which we don't go is actually questioning the building blocks of the society that creates individualism and questioning. It's a strange sort of arbitrary, I wouldn't really say arbitrary, but strange sort of limit that people know kind of isn't really there, but we'll all agree to respect that limit. There's that view of things. Then there's the, uh, the view that says, if you even start thinking about that, if you even start thinking about questioning our core values, we are going to disintegrate as a society and we'll get back to Hobbesian chaos and all that implies. Um, what is it that keeps us attached to those boundaries? Is it fear or is it the knowledge that we have created something as a truth that may not be true, but we're assuming it's true to get a certain result. In other words, we want more individualism, more individual freedom, um, more individual self-expression, but we don't want that to lead to society disintegrating. So what we'll do is we'll create these sort of boundaries in, in the form of the flag, the constitution, and the national anthem that we do not question in and of themselves. Or if we do question them, we question them on a, in a completely ivory, ivory towerish kind of way, which is, I think, how most people see it. Even the biggest tub-thumping American patriot, I think, understands that the world won't go crashing down if, over a couple of beers with your buddies uh, after work, you say, you know, sometimes I wonder about all this patriotism stuff. Like, why do we do it all? And I, and don't get me wrong, I, I got a great big old glory in the front of my house, and I get uh, all teary-eyed listening to the national anthem being sung just like anybody else. But you ever stop and think about all this, and you wonder, well, what the hell is all this? You know, I'm sure that most people are quite comfortable thinking that way, or even keeping it to themselves. But when you see it being said out loud, and when you say, when you see people questioning it to the point where you sort of say that they actually want to push the limits of this and not just understand it for what it is, then the fear comes out. You are trying to destroy civilization. We all have our sacred cows and our boundaries of conduct, and I think this is what people who attack relativism are really afraid of. Um, it's not that relativism is a intellectually unsustainable form of discourse. Um, and I'm not even saying that I agree with, rel with, with being cast as a relativist, because I'm not. Because a relativist, in my opinion, would see relativity or being a relativist as an end in itself. I don't. Um, I see, I maybe I've arrived at a position that looks awfully close to dogmatic relativism, but I don't see it that way at all. I'm just trying to see things for what they really are. I'm brazenly saying to Lovecraft, no, uh, I'm going to challenge your assertion that there are doors that one must not open and facts that one must not know. Um, I may conduct my life in the normal conventional way, but as far as my understanding of the underlying reality out there, I want to understand it. I want to know actually what's going on here. Um, is that a seditious idea? Is that a dangerous idea? Or is the idea of not questioning things even more dangerous? There's a thought, eh?